everyone, j Row Lights here. Today is June 6th, so I think it is the most appropriate time to honor and remember the men and women who served in World War II and talk about how Zippo, just a very tiny lighter, had a huge impact on the war effort and just World War II in general and has become an iconic symbol. Today, we have George Kurtz. He is a expert on World War II lighters. We will go through the history of that World War II Zippo. George, welcome. We're so glad to have you. Oh, thank you. Great to be here. Thank you for taking the time. It really is a special, special iconic Zippo. Everyone knows the World War II lighter as the Black Crackle, but that that really didn't come until later. So how about we start at the very beginning of the World War II lighter, and when did it start? Well, it all originally started now, December 7, 1941, is when Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. Um, Zippo was still making their, their Zippo lighters out of uh, they're chrome plated brass, you know, like they normally did. But when the war had started and the United States says it's going to be inevitable that the United States is going to be entering World War II. So beginning in 1942, I mean, right at the beginning of the United States in the World War II, they said, well, you know, we can't use br brass or grade one steel. We need to use a more porous grade two steel. So they contracted out and bought a large amount of this grade two steel. The problem is when they first started making these grade two steel World War II Zippos, they weren't really black crackles. They were a, a steel case. Uh, they tried to chrome plate them, didn't, was unsuccessful. So they said, well, we need to do something. So uh, they actually sent out a letter saying that they had problems with their first run of these steel case Zippos from corrosion and everything else. So they said, well, we need to change gears per se. And so what they did is they ended up um, zinc plating their grade two steel and then applying the black crackle. So in, I think it was February or March of 1942, they said, we're going with this non-reflective non zinc coated uh, black crackle. So that's kind of how the black crackle was born. How would one be able to distinguish that first round of World War II Zippos versus the Black Crackle? It's it's kind of hard because from the 41 to 42, I mean, of course, you can tell the, four, the 1941 Zippo, it's got that iconic rounded corner shape uh, when they got into it. So if you can find a, a 41, now, of course, the 1941 Zippo was made out of brass, chrome-plated brass. Uh, when they got into their first run, they made the same shape, which is a rounded corner, but they made that in steel. So if you find the rounded corner, uh, I got one laying around here somewhere, but it's a you know rounded corners, and then non-coated. I mean, you can yes. tell if it's coated or not. Um, but in because in '42, uh, when they started their strictly World War II Zippos. Uh, they went more with the flat top, flat bottom, sharper edges. Mm -hmm. So you can tell that starts into their 42s. About how many do you think they started producing at the very beginning of the war? Right. I think in their first year, which is, you know, 1942. And like I say, with World War II Zippo lighters, you, and we'll, get, we'll probably get into this. 1942 was their first delve into making these World War II Zippo lighters. Now, of course, the World, 1942 was the only year they, they made flat top, flat bottom, four barrel hinge, unmarked insert. Uh, in 1943, when we really got right into the war, they changed it to a three barrel hinge, uh, tented top and bottom and a marked insert. So of the 1942s, just for 1942, I think they made around 900,000 wow. of, of just the 1942s, an employee of Zippo that worked during World War II. And they were in the actual paint department of Zippo when they black crackled the World War II Zippo lighters. And he actually detailed the paint process 
on how they did it and what the paint combination was. And for a while, I I still do it every once in a while, is I do replicate uh, the crackle paint. The problem is, is the World War II paint that are on black crackles is lead-based. Oh, yeah. So, That's and of problematic course- Problematic today. Yeah, and, you know, and I, I mean, I mix my own paint, but I can't replicate it with lead, so. Yeah. You know, that is a little problematic. So I can't get the exact crackle effect as what they did in World War II. Yes. And that's due because of the lead. Uh, the lead shrunk and made the crackle. That's that's pretty cool. I mean, I, I don't know how many people really know that. That's uh, As far as the black crackle paint, uh, is there a reason uh, other than just the coating of the lighter? Were there some strategic thought behind that as far as the reflection goes? And Right. Yeah, they, they used it. I mean, they knew they were going to be used for the military. Uh, and they didn't want a bright, shiny Zippo lighter floating around the battlefield. So they said if we use it, you know, and black crackle back in the, you know, the black, the, the, the actual paint crackling effect. It's been around, uh, it started in the teens and the 20s, and it went up until uh, the late 60s, early 1970s. Uh, it was a popular coating for medical equipment and everything else, but during World War II, they said it's great because it's non-reflective. Um, so you know, being non-reflective, they could carry it in their pocket, pull it out, and doesn't shine like a, you know, shine like a beacon and give away their enemy, you know, give away the enemy of their position and, you know, get bombarded or anything. Of course, you know, you light a Zippo, you're not going to yeah. muffle up the flame, but, you know, at least as far as a Zippo, I mean, you're like holding a mirror sometimes. And so they said, you know, using this black crackle um, dulled the effect of the finish of the lighter. So it was a kind of a life-saving tool for them back in the day. Yeah. If I was a GI, where would I buy one? If you were an enlisted service member, for the most part, um, you were you were pretty much standard issued one. Um, but if you couldn't find one, if the you know if you fell through the supply chain cracks or whatever, they did supply them for sale at uh, military bases, exchange, and canteens. So you could buy them there, of course. Um, the, I think the, the cost of them even back then, I think it was $1.95. So you could buy them, you know, if you could find them. But, uh, you know, of course, you know, being as popular as they was back then, you know, they were you know, even hard to find that at that time. You mentioned the popularity. How were they popular as far as among service members? Was Zippo extremely popular then well, or did it? gain traction because of specific individuals well the, the funny thing about zippo now i mean you know zippo lighter as a whole before world war ii they were struggling i mean zippo had only produced a, a couple million lighters up until world war ii and you know they had thought at some point they might even close zippo because you know it wasn't catching on but, you know, fast forward to 1942 and you know, enters the war and they said, well, hey, you know, we're going to supply this for the military. It skyrocketed. It, 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 it literally saved Zippo from closing their doors, per se, because and all the service members loved them. You know, it was their essential tool in the field because, I mean, you know, I mean, you're talking about guys that, you know, spend months at a time in the trenches, on the battlefield, wherever. And, you know, they want a cigarette because they're dealing with the daily stress and there's their handy lighter and, you know, they, they pop it out. And it actually was probably one of the most popular tools in a serviceman's kit in World War II. Uh, and a couple high level individuals like Dwight Eisenhower, MacArthur, they actually have letters to George Blaisdell about how impact how much of an impact zippo has had on their men right correct yeah oh correct i mean because like i say i mean it was it was probably one of the most coveted items that a gi could carry during the time you know if you did, if you found a gi and he didn't have a zippo lighter you know he was probably the enemy or something but uh it was you know it was you know probably one of the, the greatest things that they could have and it saved and it literally saved zippo because it made it so popular and if you see a lot of the 
uh, magazine articles during World War II, you know, they even, companies hyped it up, even Zippo hyped it up as, you know, one of the most, you know, influential items that a, a service member could have because, you know, everybody wanted it. And you could read newspaper articles and you know, everything else of service members writing home to ask their loved ones to write to Zippo to have a Z Zippo lighter sent to them in wherever. And that's, I mean, that's how much wow. of an influence it, it, it took on the service members and Zippo and the community itself. So speaking of individual service members, this is where I want to hear some stories about the Zippos that you have personally. Have you ever been able to track one of your Zippos down to a service member? Now, my, my World War II ones, no. I, I mean, most of the ones that I have, for the most part, are, unless I picked it up from a family member or something like that, then it would be a little bit easier. But most of the ones that I picked up, you know, they're there's really no way to tell who owned them or anything else. Now, I, I have had that with Vietnam era Zippo lighters. I picked up a couple of Vietnam era Zippo lighters and said, well, geez, you know, I wonder if the service member's still alive. And, you know, actually found one in Georgia and one in Wyoming. Wow. Uh, they were still alive and I sent them their Zippo lighters back. But uh, as far as World War II ones, it's kind of it's kind of hard because they made so many of them and you know it's not like they have a you know it'd be great if they all had little pieces of paper with their names in it but if you had uh, out of your collection if you had a one zippo that could talk and to tell you the story which one would it be <laughs> that'd be that'd be a little hard I guess, <laughs> there, there, there's so many that are, you know with having as many as i have um, it's just weird to try and figure out which one would you yeah. be the best conversation. Now, I do have a red crackle uh, that, which is a tanker's uh, issued Zippo lighter from World War II. They painted their Zippo lighters red so they could find them inside the tanks. So, um, you know, hmm. it'd be great to see the the you know what that story on that lighter would be. You know, yeah. what tank it was in. You know, where it went during the war, uh, so, something like that. I also have. Uh, one Zippo lighter that is, um, uh, and I have several of them, manufacturer's flaws, uh, double stamps, lid stamps, um, you know, oddball, uh, you know, some of the more rare error stamps, you know, it'd be great to find out, well, gee, how, you know, how this guy slip through the crack or whatever. But then I also got one that has my name on it. You know, it was from World War II. They had this, the GI had his name engraved on there. And I was like, it'd be kind of neat to find out who that person was. And uh, so, I mean, it's kind of, kind of hard to narrow down exactly which one would be great. But, uh, you know, I, and that, that's the great thing about World War II Zippos is even if they're just a generic, don't know where they came from Zippo, they still have a story to tell. Yeah. You know, I, I can just imagine where half of these Zippo lighters have gone in their, in their 80 some odd years. Yeah use the word perfect loosely just because it you know it is getting up you know it's getting old uh, but do you have one that is in pristine condition with the box i do well i mean i do have pristine i mean like this okay. is that's about as pristine as you're wow. going to get for yeah a world war ii i mean that's that's beautiful you know fairly clear but yeah, can can you do the click closer to to the phone? Oh, I think so. Yeah, this you yeah. You, know, you don't get as much it's, click on, on the old ones just because I mean they are. You, you yeah, know, well, you can see the way. cam doesn't have much much movement there. No, uh, yeah, the, no. the dog ear cams really weren't as as strong as some of the other ones. Plus, again, it's also the steel. Uh, you find a lot of the World War II ones. They use the same steel that they made the case out of for their cams and everything else and the cam gotcha. spring. And you'll find a lot of World War II Zippos, the, the cam spring is broken because it's the lower grade steel. It doesn't give uh, the same tension as, as a brass cam. That makes but, sense. Uh, as, far, yeah. as far as boxes, I mean, I do have, you know, here's the, the brown box, mm -hmm. the brown Zippo box. But then I've also done, I also have, 
this is what I've started doing too. This is a white and blue box, mm. strictly a, a 1942 box. I think uh, that the sign is very similar to. Yep, as, a, as the 42 box. Right, gotcha. They did okay. do this same box, which is, it's a white box. They also did this in, in a red box as well. Zippos were, you know, during World War II were taken all over the world from Europe to uh, Africa, even, you know, like with uh, with patents uh, moved through uh, through Africa and uh, and and Italy. And then you have in the Pacific um, were Zippos available for other uh, uh, countries, servicemen like Great Britain at the time or France or. For the most part, no. I mean, if a British troop or a French troop or any of the other troops that were allied to the United States, if they came aboard a military base and they went to the exchange or the canteen and found them, you know, they were available, they could purchase them. Um, you very rarely, they were never issued to a, an allied force. Um, now, of course, you know, Due to the, the the flaws of war, you know, if they ran across a U.S. soldier that had been deceased, you know, sometimes you know they do get ravaged a little bit and yeah. found their way into somebody else's pocket. Um, you you do find a few of them from you know Germany. Uh, there's been talk back and forth that they're actually you know real German-owned Zippo lighters from American mm -hmm. troops. It's possible. I don't. I don't believe it a lot of times, but uh, you know, it, it happens all the time. And you know, that's the the downside of of wars. You know, things find their ways to other people's pockets. What type of fluid did they use for their lighters? Did Zippo provide fluid, or did they use like kerosene or something like that? They they did provide fluid, but I mean, you know, it it didn't last very quickly with as many as many lighters as they had there and as many troops as they had there the fluid didn't last and they couldn't keep shipping it over there and over there and over there because of the time constraints you know it wasn't like mm -hmm. today where you could throw something in the mail and it's in england in a day and a half you know they usually had to put it on cargo planes or ships or whatever and it took a month to get there like the mail you know their their yeah. mail took forever so they 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 did find there was a lot of um, companies in Europe and Italy and Great Britain that did that did make lighter fluid um, for other lighters, you know, Dunhills and and and, and the like uh, that they could use if they could find it. But they also did uh, did resort to using kerosene, diesel fuel. And I mean, with a Zippo lighter. If you're in the situation, you can pretty much use anything that is combustible. Uh, that that you can, if it can light by a spark, they would use it. So uh, at one point, I'm sure they were renting jerry cans of diesel fuel or gasoline or whatever to use in yeah. their zip. And uh, as, you know, did it last as long? No, but they used it. So because they they really didn't have anything else to use. You know, matches probably weren't the best to use in that wet environment and humid environment. Yep, I mean, and and even and even then, I mean, you know, matches, you know, you, it was a hard, hard item to get, you know, that was the great thing about having a Zippo, you know, you could stick it in your pocket, you almost never lost it. And, you know, it was always there where matches, if they got wet, mm -hmm. you know, you couldn't use them and then you're stuck without something and, it it was a it was a good life saving thing for even you know the 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 the, the replacements of them. So you have something really really unique that would have been delivered to that uh, uh, that base camp or the commissary, what whatever the shop, uh, the canteen shop that Zippos were delivered in. So you right. want to show show us that and yep. tell us a little bit about that. This year I got this from Bradford. It is a World War II actual shipping crate. It's all an olive drab shipping crate. Got the Zippo stencils on there. Originally had a uh, on the back side. It originally had their tag of where it was being sent to. A tag's gone, but uh, yeah. this was actually picked up in Bradford. Uh, it's olive drab, black marking. You know, it opens up on the wow. end. You can fit them all in there, and you know, like I say, uh, you know. I know a lot of the actual 
Zippo boxes were uh, white pine, not painted. This is actually being olive drab colored and being of the time frame because it doesn't have zip codes on it. So I said it has to be from the World War II period. So I'm guessing, you know, it's a World War II shipping crate. And that, and that, that is your goal is to get 200 World War II Zippos. You need about 83 more, right? About 83 more. Yeah. Okay. I just, I, so I just purchased one and I traded for two more. So I'm up to 120 now. So, okay. Um, but 80 uh, more was, and you'll be able to fit 200, 200 Zippos. Zippos. That yeah. will be a picture we will all love to see. I usually ask, what is your, you know, your top three wish list of Zippos? But as a World War II collector, that's really challenging. You know, you just never know what you're going to come across. But right. if there was, you know, one specific Zippo, World War II Zippo to add in your collection, what would it be? It could be that $250,000 one on eBay from Dwight Eisenhower, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I probably, I think we would, the top one to have is, of course, the, the Ernie Pyle one. I mean, you know, everybody says, got to have, you know, you're not a World War II collector until you have an Ernie Pyle. As we wrap up, as I do, everyone, I have what I call burning questions, questions that Zippo collectors, whether you're new or old, usually ask. We see them in the groups almost every single week. So do, do you smoke? I don't anymore. I used to, at you know, back when I first started being in the military, of course, you know, it's a, the bad habit that you pick up because that's where you get all the breaks. But, uh, you know, I did in the military. Once I retired, I said, you know, I got to stick around as long as the World War II Zippos are, so I better stop while I'm ahead. So uh, we kind of already mentioned this, but just uh, what are your thoughts on World War II special editions or, or World War II replicas? I don't mind them. I mean, you know, they, they've done a nice job and, you know, it, it, it's a good commemorative. If some, and, and, and for somebody who can't, you know, readily afford, a, you know, three, four hundred dollar original, it's a, it's a good replacement to have, you know, it, it's, it, it's a good tribute. Uh, do I have any of them? No. I mean, I, I, I just never really got into buying any of the, the VEVJs or, you know, the Sans Iwo Jima ones or anything like that. But they're, they're, they're a great thing to have. It's not my thing. I, I, I don't usually buy anything newer. So, you know, it's, you know, if I, if I saw one for a deal, I might pick it up. But for the most part, I'll, I'll stick to wasting my money. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Well, not wasting your money. You are no, investing wasting. into investing, history. Yes. <laughs> investing my money. <laughs> so uh, now you and Bill can duke this question out together. I don't know if you've seen this. See him say this. What about black crackle? People that are going to get mad at me yeah. because I do clean them. World War II inserts to clean or not to clean? World War II inserts are not to be cleaned. Uh, the, the reason why you do not clean a World War II insert, and I've seen people do this, the original World War II inserts, along with the inside of the cases, had a electroplated zinc alloy put on them, uh, specifically for the World War IIs, because, of course, the same reason why they painted them black crackle is to keep them from reflecting sunlight. So with the zinc alloy, if you ever look at a World War II Zippo insert, for the most part, they're this dull gray color. Mm -hmm. That's to keep them from being reflective. And that's why Zippo hmm. did that. You, and if you clean up a World War II, World War II Zippo insert, you're removing that, uh, that zinc electroplating and kind of erasing the history of why they did it. Well, George, thank you so much for joining us today. I think, you know, as I've said, on this day, June 6th, to honor and remember those who, who have served and who served in World War II, and Zippo continues to, to honor those through commemorative editions, and also their history lives on through those. Just a simple lighter. So th thanks for joining us today. Oh, it was my pleasure to be here. Like, share, and subscribe. This is Jero Lights. We'll see you on the next one.